Hello, this is Benjamin Boyce, and welcome to the Boyce of Reason podcast. Today's guest is Greg Ellis, who is an actor, and uh, I don't know if he's decorated, but he certainly is an accomplished individual. In this conversation, we talk about his new project, The Respondent, which is an online podcast and discussion platform where Greg explores modern masculinity and the ways in which one can gain a sense of individuality and uh, self-control self-autonomy in such a messy, messy world. So without further ado, here is Greg Ellis. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Really interested in uh, hearing about your project, hearing about your life and making sense with you of about what it is to be a man, I suppose. Well, or, I, I guess we'll, we'll see. Kind of, we're all sense makers, aren't we? And meaning seekers and meaning makers. Yeah. I think, you know, I... Uh, I just think, um, well, I, this whole experience has been and is about to begin to be, you know, quite marvelous because I have such great people who've come on board kind of close to the launch date, but, um, you know, graphics people and editors and digital marketers and, and I've never thought about revenue streams before because <laughs> this project isn't about money making. It's about sense making, meaning making and having that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's really what it is. Well, um, for the people who have been following me, who kind of, I guess, expect me to be talking about one topic that I've been focusing on, which is current events having to do with uh, racial tensions in America, loosely speaking. But this conversation we're going to have is a different conversation. You're working on a project called The Respondent. And I don't, I don't want to put words in your mouth. What does that project aim for or toward? Well, it's it's a multimedia, I guess a, a, there's my little dog red in the background. It's a multimedia conversation on modern masculinity. A few years ago, maybe three mm. or four years ago, I started seeing more and more um, signal, signaling and messaging in mainstream media and uh, social media about toxic masculinity and the rise of Me Too. And I think we got to this place where... Um, the notion of believing everyone, every set of people, um, was inherently flawed to some degree. And, you know, it's a lot more nuanced. Uh, it's not as easy as that. And, and I saw a place where the court of public opinion had be become so rabid and judgmental and the apology pathways were being hmm. um, blocked to such a point that... Um, Many people I saw from a distance and some people I knew were just being cancelled and person just by the whiff of a sensational allegation, a story, a wrong comment. Mm -hmm. And it was a real fear, uh, particularly in, in, you know, in Hollywood and, and the greater society. And so, you know, the messaging of toxic masculinity, all men bad, all men aren't bad, all women aren't good, all men aren't good, all women aren't bad. It's... It's way more complex than that. And how do you have that conversation when ultimately a whole group of people or ideologies are, are, are projecting that all men are bad and every single person that's stating uh, an allegation hmm. is to be believed. We have a court of law for that. We have uh, you know presumption of innocence for that. Uh, we're judged by a jury of our peers beyond a reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm. And and having been through the personal experience of particularly family law and realizing that in family law, parents have no right, and particularly fathers have less rights than criminals, and mm -hmm. how family law is not answerable to the Supreme Court, and just all of these findings. And in family law, um, the person who is responding to an allegation or um, a disillusionment or um, any petition made by a petitioner or a plaintiff is called the respondent. And that ties in, I think, with the um, underlying message of personal responsibility, self-reliance. How can we stop finding fault, seeking blame, and becoming more responsible and owning that sense that we are all responsible. How was I responsible for the part I played in this particular situation? Did I add fuel to the fire or did I turn the mirror on self and, and go, you know what, I could have done better and how can I do better? 
And right now, I think in society, there's a lot of do better, do better projection mm-hmm. outwards messaging without us looking inside and going, you know what, let's try and have a little bit of a heterodox, you know, critical thinking, civil discourse um, with, with the people we disagree with, mm-hmm. you know. And I'm, I'm sure that people are going to be disagreeing with me when I start my words out about the respondent. It might be my mindset right now because I'm, I'm invested in teasing apart uh, current events right now. So I, I feel a little overwhelmed with that. But it, it feels like we need to kind of not dismantle the discourse, but really start over and, and kind of take, find a place to take a couple of deep breaths and reinitiate uh, a conversation and, and just even thinking about what is a conversation between one person and another. You working in media, you and your entire industry is talking to all the people all the time and you guys are uh, thinking of ways to to speak publicly. And, and you, you spoke about one thing that's interesting I would like you to explain more of, but the apology pathway or what happens when, when there's a public blame or some, some personal incident incident becomes a universal, you know, uh, story. And how, how are you able to maintain personal responsibility when every one of your actions is potentially going to be picked apart? And because we're all basically media stars now, like all of our actions are there for everybody to see and for mobs to pick up and for the whole public to pick apart. It, it's really difficult. I feel like it's really difficult to get back to, I'm an individual in a society of other individuals. And, and you know, I, I did something wrong, or I didn't do something wrong. And proceeding down the path of investigating that is so fraught, because everybody's going to have an opinion, everybody's going to, you know, make hay with what you're doing or what's going on. Yeah, yeah, I, I hear you. And I think that um, that sense of how can I tend to myself? How can I pay attention to my behavior, uh, my feelings, um, what my body, my organism is trying to tell me in that moment of reactivity and be less reactive and more responsible? How can I engage without when I feel I've been canceled? Um, I call it the reputation savage um, in terms of, uh, you know, I think it was Nikki Crick. I've talked about Nikki before. She was a psychologist, I think, in Minnesota. And she did this groundbreaking study on on the differences between men and women in terms of personality traits and, and behavior and aggression. And men move quicker to aggression by way of physical violence. Women move quicker by way of the spoken word. And that fascinates me. And that's not to say all women and all men, because, you know, I, I know many men who can reputation savage with word of mouth. But I think the reputation savage has taken hold. Hmm. And, and I think that we are in this seminal moment. I started to see it a few years ago. I could see, you, you can kind of see it's You don't know when, how, and, and at what moment it's going to rise up. Yeah. And, but, you know, it's no surprise to me that we are where we're at when just a month ago, we were in a global state of panic demic, as I call it, because mm-hmm. this deadly virus was on the loose. Our economy was threatened. Uh, our finances were challenged. We were losing jobs and suddenly we're housebound and locked in and that connectivity. And then even that messaging, I think, was flawed. We shouldn't be social distancing at all. We should mm. be socially connected. We should be physically distancing because we human beings are sentient creatures and we need that human contact, that collective community to come together. And I think that's what the respondent is trying to do, is, is to bring that conversation together and invite all and every mm. person that wants to be at the table and have a civil discourse, knowing that there's going to be sometimes the people who you know, yell the loudest will be heard, and how we can sit in that and hold space with them. And part of your theme... I guess your mode is civil discourse, but part of your theme is about masculinity. You brought up modern masculinity. I wonder, is that in contrasted to uh, classic masculinity? Or what do you well, mean? <laughs> what do you think of modern? What is what it makes masculinity I modern? You know, in the in the in the uh, first episode of the respondent, I'm talking with Stephen Fry, and I mentioned tonic masculinity, which uh, I believe that hashtag. I'm not. I'm quite ignorant of hashtag, but it was started by Dr. Cameron Sepa. Um, who's on ThinkSpot, and um, he was—he's a psychiatrist, worked up in uh, 
San Francisco, and I think he's now based in LA and he's launching a new a new um, initiative soon. It, it came from the to- toxic masculinity and that whole notion of what masculinity was and the fact that, you know, you're a misogynist, you're a misogynist. Well, well okay, you're a misandrist, you're a misandrist. Where does yeah, that get yeah. us? Yeah. Oh, toxic masculinity. Oh, toxic femininity. Where does that get us? I, I saw very little conversation about masculism. We use the word feminism, but not the word masculism. And what is masculism? What does it mean to be a man? Is it the Jocko Willink school mm-hmm. of, of being a motivator and a leader and you lead from the back so supporting your, you know, or is it someone who tends to their feelings and, and can effectively tend to the somatic and, and talk tenderly and, and, and be calm? And I think it's a combination of many things. I don't, I don't purport to have the answer, but I'm on the lookout. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah, to- tonic as in uh, some sort of uh, you know, cure-all kind of thing, or, or tonic as in like the, the musical structure, which... Oh, that's very good. Very good. I hadn't thought of the, I hadn't thought of the latter. Yeah, yeah, let's, so let's, let's, yeah, let's take care of the musical structure as well, like more <laughs> harmonious. Uh, yeah, we, we spoke briefly before about uh, masculinism or, or men's rights activism, and you had a middle way. It seems like you're carving a middle way. And you brought up Jocko Williams, but there's two kind of negative masculinities or negative responses to men's rights. Actually, there, there's a number of different negatives. I think there's mm-hmm. like incels, uh, involuntary celibates who seem to operate on resentment that they're not getting something from women. And then there's also like the, the red pill men's rights movement, which is about extracting what you want from women. And I don't, I'm not on board with those things. I, I, I much rather, I get much more enjoyment out of my relationships with women when there is mutual respect. And, um, so there seems to be like a very weak, pathetic way of being a men's rights activist. And then there's an overcompensatory way of being a men's rights activist. And both of those, I was thinking about this yesterday, both of those have, a lot of misogyny, a lot of negativity towards towards women. It seems like, and and they don't really see women as as individuals. And and I'm sure that there's a lot of parts of those movements that don't have that in there. But it seems like you're trying to carve out something that is that is uh, grounded in something other than I'm a man because I'm not this, or I'm a man because I act this way. And could you ex- explain like? like what is healthy masculinity and, and, or maybe in your life, like how you learned to be a, a good man? Well, I mean, look, I, I, I don't purport to be necessarily a good man. Okay. You know, I'm, I'm just a man. Well, you can be you a know, bad boy and a good man. Yeah, 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 well, like I, like I love women. That, that's the precursor. Women are amazing. And, you know, I love men too. You know, that's the other hashtag men too. Um, and, I think there are there are a number of there are a number of ways that maybe we could we can have this conversation better. I remember originally when I started the project, um, a couple of um, organisations, let's say, had been in touch with me about combining and, and sharing a message, and there was this element, this underlying element of, and it wasn't necessarily that they were bitter and angry, but the messaging sometimes came across as bitter and angry. And yes, there was the other person who was. And, and sometimes for good reason, you know, mm. um, women can be, you know, at times certain individuals can be, you know, pretty spiteful and men can be very devious and mean. And, and I think that's it. It's the individual and the group. Mm. And I've seen so much of this mob group think hate speech about men and as a group. And it's breaking out of that and saying, hey, look, we're all individuals. You know, this, mm. this rise of, um, I don't want to linger on it too much, but the postmodernist, progressive, radical left, extreme ideology, it's no good fighting what you perceive to be the hate of one side with more hate. We have to mm-hmm. move from hateful to grateful, especially at a time when we're on lockdown and there's so many challenges and an election coming up. And many people are are pushed to work remotely, you know, are moving from the gray to the green, if you will. I think we're moving more back towards nature and away from technology as the reverse psychology of device dependency keeps pulling us in. Oh, interesting. 
you know, and how we can keep having conversations and be better men mm -hmm. um, and champion each other and shepherd each other and mentor each other. You know, I, I, I don't, I don't profess to have all the answers. I've just been looking and studying and learning as much as I can from as many different resources as possible. Well, if you were pressed to give some first principles of the path towards being a good man, let's say, what are some of the, the basics, the, the starter pack for being a good man? Uh, I would say, gosh, that's a tough one. Um, Personal responsibility is, is number one. That's really the message of the respondent. And that's, you know, me, you know, the old me, myself and I, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's me, myself, the inner critic, the inner dialogue, the many versions of mine that talks, you know, the thought, the conversation we have in our mind, how we can talk ourselves back to a, mature, a more mature place of mind, a little bit more emotional sobriety or emotional uh, uh, emotional honesty, one might call it, mm -hmm. uh, and just focus on self, capital S, and keep tending to that and self-regulating that and, and owning mistakes. It's becoming so difficult to do because of that apology pathway being so blocked and plugged up. And we have to find a way, you know, when mm -hmm. people have served their time, whether it be in the court of public opinion or, or, or incarcerated in prison, and they come out, people deserve second chances. And it seems to me that we, we aren't giving the benefit of the doubt. You know, I talked with Stephen Fry about doubt and uncertainty. And, you know, we talked about uh, identity politics and political correctness. And, you know, it's how we treat each other that matters. And we will always have moments of reactivity and in our interpersonal relationships with our partners, with our coworkers, with our employees, our bosses, family members, and how we can move forward through those moments to reset. I call it the reset. Mm -hmm. You can call for a reset. You know, you and I are arguing, you know, it goes to get physical. Okay. And it's, and it's not going reset. It's like, it's, it's, it's paying attention to self and going reset. Just take a, get off the battlefield. You know, how can I just remain calm and family? I think family recently with the lockdown, seeing how many people were forced to be in the same home. And some might say, Oh, you know, Bully you, you, you're home with your family. It's tough. It's really tough to be in a small, confined space for long stretches of time with individuals who you can't escape from hmm. your entire life. So I think family. When I started, when I started writing the book, was a, I think one of my original uh, titles for the book was uh, I, I think not title, but just an idea with some family law and that was crossed out and i wrote war you know struck through because these family wars these familial wars that we're having um on 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 media and then in private um i just see it it it, it, it becoming more tense and more extreme the tyranny of the urgent mm -hmm. is so demanding mm -hmm. and we're taking very few breaks to actually tend to the somatic senses and the felt senses and, um, you know, come together. Yeah. So. There, there's a good point that you touched against about the impossibility of achieving responsibility without forgiveness. If, if you can't make an apology that's not yeah. forced, if you, and if you can't process and really take an inventory of what you did wrong, why yes. you did wrong, and people don't care why you did something wrong. It seems like, the mob doesn't care why you did something wrong. It, oh. It's caught up in, in shame. There's no, there's no group forgiveness. There's group shame, but there's no group forgiveness. There's group punishment, right. but there's no forgiveness. And without that forgiveness, there's no responsibility. Yeah, I, I talk about um, giving the striven, you know, the striven forgive that we strive to forgive. And I say forgive others, not because they deserve forgiveness mm -hmm. necessarily, but because... You deserve peace. It brings self relief and self regulation. But I agree with you. It does take a moment to get to that place, the processing time. And if we can shorten that processing time so that it's not 
days, weeks, years, or forever that the person has been cancelled, um, then it's a better society to live in, isn't it? Where we're all getting along more, where we're, we're not as heated. We may have been an eight or a nine on the modulation dial of behavioral expression, and we brought it down to a four or a five, but it's still better than an eight or a nine. <laughs> and I think you touched on shame as well. You know, shame and vulnerability. I, studied, I started studying that about four years ago, particularly shame. Um, and what I found was illuminating, you know, I went through um, some of the, the people who really study shame, like Brene Brown. And Brene Brown had, uh, she inspired me early on. And what I've seen recently with, with Brene, and she's, she's brilliant. Uh, I would love to have a conversation with her. But I see more of this, um, this extreme uh, wokeism. Hmm. It's really, really what it is. It's, it, it's just, it's so um, group you know, and, and I think that that might be difficult to, um, it might just be a symptom of our times, technology, the age of technology, the age of unreason, a whole confluence of things coming together to create this shame and rage inferno that literally gets whipped up and you know, shame prowls the borders. It's always there. We don't talk about the affect of shame. We don't talk about the, the, the psychology of shame and the biology of shame. The word shame brings up a, a, an unhealthy or healthy, depending on perspective, dose of itself just by mentioning it. I call it the human kryptonite hmm. of emotion. And really, it's just humility at its, you know, at its hmm. core. Um, How do you balance humility with courage? vulnerability and vulnerability okay, okay. you know it's strength personified it's the courage to hold that space when shame is telling us that it's seemingly terrifying and insurmountable to stay in that space with someone and be and remain intimate which is knowing and being known that's my definition of intimacy you know how can i listen with curiosity share to be known and hold that space with someone um, and I can always do better with that. You know, I've got these big headphones on and sometimes I don't listen. And, and there's a difference between hearing someone and listening to them and then taking me in and staying present throughout their entire thought of conversation. So I think, um, you know, vulnerability is, um, and what did I write about shame? Shame, you know, Brene Brown talked about vulnerability as, as, as being strength personified. You know, it's courage personified. And I wrote, Shame is weakness perceived. And that short little quote for me kind of sums it up. We're perceiving a weakness um, and our inability to actually own the carried shame, the um, projected shame of childhood, family of origin, how we move through trauma or traumatic events, uh, how, we, um, how we overcome adversity, uh, loss, grief, the living grief. Um, you know, when I talk about living grief, losing someone who's still alive, you know, how you can relieve. I, I wrote a paper on relieving griefing, you know, re continually returning to relieve that living grief, mm -hmm. that ambivalent grief. Like no one quite understands that. There is a, there is a, a tragedy to someone losing, you know, if you lose someone you care about in your life and they die, you have a grieving process. You know, I had a virtual funeral last week for my auntie who was married to, for 62 years to my uncle. And there was a grieving process. And, and, and it was wonderful to celebrate her life and think back through the memories. There are other people I've lost in my life and I tend to that living grief. And there are so many more people like that out there. Um, that, you know, we talk about, I don't even understand the phrases, ghosting and gaslighting and all the, it's, there's so many new phrases. I can't <laughs> talk of them, you know? Well, there, there's uh, new phrases for the age old process of people dividing and, and being split apart, being riven by uh, like uh, an opinion, a religion, a ideology, a movement. And, and it seems like there are certain yeah. aspects of, what you called wokeism that have a lot of uh, a pattern of behavior of, of cleaving differences and, and 
making inseparable divides between individuals. And, uh, and I guess the, the process of, uh, of being confronted with somebody who disagrees with you so strongly that, that you are in, you're non-personed by them is probably on the rise a little bit right now, particularly. And I'm, I'm hoping the moral panic will, will calm down a little bit, but one needs to speak out about it and hopefully provide people with, with the courage um, and, and the, I guess the, the perspective to see beyond it, to see it as a process, to even see radicalism or, or this, this, uh, this hunched downness of, uh, of tribalism uh, as kind of a process that, that hopefully can be relieved, relaxed a little bit. Well, I hope so too. I, 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 I don't know if, if it will be, hmm. there's the doubt, you know, for some time I've seen it on the rise for years now. I've, yeah. I've been watching yeah. it on the rise. And, you know, I just, I'm a firm believer that identity politics devours, it eventually devours itself. I watched the Democratic, you know, uh, debates for nomination, and, and it was clear to me that, 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 that there would be the self-devouring going on, and eventually the last man standing would devour himself. And, you know, frankly, that's because you can't survive identity politics. When, when Joe Biden, who seems like a very, you know, decent i don't know him he's a politician so mm, there's the disclaimer yeah, um yeah. someone's got to be and uh, i think it's worse these days than it ever was because it used to be you'd work across the aisle now it's you know it's just the parting of the red sea. like there's no one will if we're at war both sides and when he says you know you ain't black the, if you don't vote for him if you don't vote for me then you ain't black i mean i don't think even i think it's a twisted place that perhaps and you know it might be you know some some of us older fogies who are trying to survive in the um the silos and the the identity politics and the little mini groups and 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 please them and i you know you just you just kai's the wrong hashtag on twitter last week i think it was and it was like you know we're just trying to help you oh you do you're a racist you're a, i'm like what? And it literally was it literally was me 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 saying every life matters. They, they do. Every life matters. And if you don't believe that, you're gonna go around killing people or just be that person who, yeah, cancelled her. Well, she committed to it. She she took her own life, not committed. She ended the act of her life. Oh well, but she does or he deserved it. Mm -hmm. No, no one that's but hey, you know. I looked into the statistics specifically with divorced men and, and there are eight divorced men. I think it's every day in America take their own lives. It might be every week. I just check. I'm, I'm, it, but every, every single, you know, the, the, the stats on suicide are in I mean, they're just out of, and why is that? Now I know there's so many different variables for that. But what I do know is without a shadow of the doubt, that family law in America is killing and culling good men, good fathers, and, and just as importantly and tragically, there are boys and girls who are growing up without a father in their home. And every child's basic human right to have access to their parents is sacrosanct. And, and when I say rights, I don't mean everyone has the right to because there are criminals, there are people who aren't good. And, but I'm talking about the people who find themselves, the, 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 the good men, shall we say flawed, you know, tomorrow I vow to make better mistakes, but find themselves in a family law courtroom and realize right away that they are the respondent. They are guilty until proven innocent. Many times guilty till proven more guilty. Hmm. Uh, we saw it happen with Johnny Depp, even though Johnny knew what was, you know, people who knew him knew what was really going on. All the while that, that, that just whipped up into a media frenzy. And it, that, sank, you know, Amber Heard presenting herself as a domestic violence spokesperson, whilst at the same time slicing the tip of his finger off and attacking him. Abuse can go both ways. 
bad behavior can go both ways. And I think that uh, we really need to reform this system that, that, that is still in some sense stuck in the 60s and 70s. And, um, hmm. you know, roles have changed. And um, I think there, are, there is so much we can do. And having looked into this for, for four or five years now, there's no incentive from within to change because everyone in the system is milking the system. It's called churning. So the state bars, um, which are predominantly run, I believe, by the, the uh, attorneys and judges who were attorneys, they write the family law code book. So they're writing their own playbook. They're planting their own money trees. And the misery and suffering for families in America is, is, takes a back seat to the misery and suffering to families trying to get into the country who are separated. Hmm. And that's not to say that I don't feel for the suffering of them. Of course I do. Every family, as much as possible, should stay together. But talking about the people who are ignorant, I think I call it the framing of an ignorant man or woman, because it happens both ways. It's just my belief that it happens more to men. I talked with Christina Hoff Summers on, on episode two of The Respondent. And um, we were, she talked about her book, The War on Boys, and education reform, and how we're removing recess away, and the books we're giving boys, and we're expecting them to just sit there, and they're lagging so far behind uh, young girls in every metric, nearly. And we talked about prison reform and the disparities of men in prison uh, to, to women and the sentencing and black men. Just, you know, th if you go down the numbers and it got to family law and she said, oh, I looked at that. I looked into that. And it was just way too toxic. I can't even go there. And that's it. Everyone's afraid to talk about it. Well, how did you how did you become awoke <laughs> about family law. Do you mind speaking either personally or give us an overview of the basic problems or what it is and why, why you think that's the issue of the day? Yeah, I was, I was married for 20 years, happily married, never a real um, issue, no criminal record, no issues of disturbance, everything was fine. And then suddenly I was thrust into a dystopia based on a, um, uh, a, um, a hearsay allegation, let's put it that way. And I realized through experience um, that th if it could happen to me, it could happen to anyone. And then I realized, oh, it is happening to many. And then I went, oh, it's been happening to many for decades. In fact, there's a whole cottage industry behind this. You know, there's a whole um, machine. Well, why, why is family law distinct from other forms of law? Like, uh... well, well, I don't know too much about other forms of law because I've never really, you know, up until what happened to me, I've never been yeah. in trouble with the law. But you, you know? say it's not regulated. It's not answerable to the Supreme Court. It, it, it takes... I mean, I'm sure in regular law, you know, you talk about criminal law, it's the presumption of innocence. Okay. So in family law, if you and I, let's just hypo hypothesize right now, Benjamin, you know, in a, you know, homosexual way, you and I were in a domestic partnership and I decided that, you know, you, uh, I wanted to, there are books on this. Okay. There's a, there's a PI, I'm not going to mention his, well, I could mention his name. It, he produces YouTube videos on how to ruin your husband. So you see, you, before your husband gets home, you, you make him dinner and you create a nice bolognese and a pasta red sauce. And you look pretty. And then when he gets home, you throw it on yourself. And when he's confused, you pick up the phone, you call the police. Police arrive. By this point, you're screaming and and husband's going, what's going on? And maybe he gets to that place of anger, you know, mm -hmm. and then is dragged away based on a hearsay allegation. There was no evidence. Okay. And, 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 and in criminal law, there has to be due process and evidence presented. There's also no oversight by the, uh, by, by, there's no executive oversight, at least by, um, uh, from the California state bar. 
I've, I've known of attorneys who've called out the system who've been disbarred because they're calling out one of their own. So it, it's just not talked about. No one really, well, some people do. But rarely do people find a way to express no oversight and uh, and you can write your own rule book like that is a absolute recipe for corruption and right. it's it's that's it, horrendous uh so yeah. if there is no oversight no accountability they can write their own law and then and then kick out people that go against lawyers that speak out against this how would reform even be possible well, this is, the, this is the deeper dive into the conversation. It's how, how do we reform what is, in essence, incentivized to be a 50, I think it's a $55 billion industry right now. And aside from, and that, aside from that's just the family law practices, aside from the, um, the public health cost in terms of suicides and mental health and on an ongoing the, the, the ongoing ptsd and all all of those because it is it's an ongoing battle to stay alive let alone stay you know financially viable and afloat and 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 not just descend even further into uh existential terror mm. at times um i think finding those solutions you know that's some of what i do on, with the respondent and will continue to do is to talk with people in the system mm -hmm. to find out how we can improve um, what is and how we can reform what's been for a while and give hope. I mean, you know, we, George Floyd has, has been in the news recently, a terrible tragedy of what happened to him, and it happens all too often. Uh, I looked into Walter Scott, who I don't know if you remember, in, I think it was South Carolina, he was, uh, he was gunned down. Um, there was an officer who fired eight times at him in the back as he was running away after a melee on the floor and five shots hit him. And it was the fifth one that took him down. Horrible, senseless death. And the police officer was, was found guilty of murder and went to prison for 20 years. Um, two weeks before that sentence, no one talks about this because it's just not, no one's interested and all of the sides, they just want the one, which is tragic. His wife, I think her name's Jamie, gave birth to their first son, Isaac, who will be five or six years old. He'll never know his father outside of prison. His experience of knowing his father will be visiting for an hour at a time or however long it is. And I don't expect people to have much empathy for that because he murdered someone. Okay, I get that. But what about Walter Scott? Walter Scott, on the day that he was pulled over for a broken taillight, he knew the end was near, I believe. I believe he was so caught in the divorce trap and he couldn't find a way out. He had been hit with child support payments. I'm not going to go into whether they were justified or not. I don't know enough about the case what i do know is he had an eight thousand he'd been in prison twice and then he had an eight thousand um, dollar uh, child support payments owing that the state collects on if you don't pay you get you get interest accrued so and not only you get interest accrued but you put, get put back in prison so you can't how can you get a job if you're continually back and forth in prison to pay the money to pay off the interest because it keeps going up and the state has no mercy none and when I say that, I believe there was an accomplice. I really do. I think he was driven to that point of, at that moment when he was pulled over and the police officer turned to, to check his ID. I think he was just, he knew he was going to get arrested because there was a warrant out and he ran. He was a desperate, desperate man, a fugitive. You know, he couldn't, he couldn't keep up with his responsibilities because frankly, the system doesn't care because deadbeat dads, they're not deadbeat, all of them. Many of them are dead broke. Hmm. You, know, you, you, you talk to the Father to Father Project, which is a support group in, in, in South Carolina, of which many of the black you know, fathers who are hit with these payments um, struggle. Walter Scott joined that group. So that's just one example of, and again, 
to me, it, 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 it matters less the pigmentation of his skin. It doesn't interest me to admonish his widow in any way, uh, you know. I, I'm not interested in vilifying the police officer. I'm th I just think about Walter Scott's son, who, who gave a, a, a moving impact statement mm -hmm. at the trial and, and just talked about, I've lost my hero, I've lost my father. He was my only father. Mm -hmm. I think about... Derek Shea, no, not Derek Shea, uh, I forget that, Michael Slaven, I think the name of the officer was, uh, who shot Walter Parks. I think of his son, Isaac. I think of these boys and their fathers whose lives have been ruined, again, not predominantly by the system, but aided and abetted mm. by family law. And that's why we need reform. So responsibility on a personal level, but re holding... Uh investigating and holding uh, the system uh, account, which is a really big project. How do you go about beginning that? I guess by speaking out about it, but um, are there support groups? Are there networks? Uh... There are, I, you know, I haven't really investigated too much of that because I've been so busy on my personal odyssey, mm. getting to a place. I knew, I knew that I had to do this alone to begin with. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, I knew I had to formulate how I was going to do it. And, um, you know, through my book, which is called The Respondent as well, I, I share my story and more details of my story and what happened and what's and all and expose some of the um, corruption um, with, and nepotism within the system and how it operates. And I think that's the first step, understanding how it operates. And I just... I just um, I think a lot of the messages within the book and the show kind of tie into who I'm becoming. Mm. I think becoming is a big, someone, uh, someone once said, you know, we God in one word and I said becoming. I think it was Sir Ian McGilchrist mentioned it as well in his chat with Dr. Jordan Peterson. But that word's a big word when we talk in terms of what the word God means to each of us as individuals, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, so I'm becoming into the respondent in this project. And it will find, in ways, it will find me of how I can be of service, how I can give back, how I can help. And look, I'm not the most articulate speaker in the world. I'm certainly not the most intellectual speaker in the world. Um, you know, put me on a stage in a symposium and, you know, I, I shall sound like I'm... No, but, you know, I'm used to playing characters and, and roles in television and movies and, and, and animation. But for me, having found this place, authenticity is the role of a lifetime. Hmm. You know, hmm. it really is. And how, how you, can, you can be authentic about your story and share as much of it as possible in, in, in as much transparency, with as much honesty, uh, to say... You know, it's when you ask me, I'm a good man. Well, I've been a good man and I've also been naughty. You know, the naughty boy in me has come out. Um, and I always strive now to try and honor my values. No one else's, mine. And what they are, are in, you know, they're important. Do you perceive what, being an insider or being involved in the Hollywood industry, me too i think it was launched in 2017 is that correct so it's been going on for three years what what do you think are the lasting changes of of it has been in the industry and and has it actually facilitated good dialogue and are there parts of it that have mutated into something good and and something bad and um, has it really shaped the way in which a man can uh, be perceived or the kinds of things that he has to focus on in public um, no I don't think it's improved the dialogue at all <laughs> I really don't I think that uh, particularly if you take if you if you are um, a Caucasian heterosexual um, artist in Hollywood and you don't align to the group think hmm. you know that's 
that's a tough. Has has that industry always know. been very heavily? Uh, I guess it's all performance based. So, ergo, it's always virtue signaling based. Is there has yeah, there I ever been flexibility of thought? Yeah, I think you know that traditionally, I think actors, artists, you know, within the community, we are. When I do, I, I, I still classify myself as a classical liberal. That's what I would say I fundamentally am. But as, as you know better than I, you know, the, the left has moved so extreme that it's not so much that I've moved or people like me have moved in terms of moderation. We've just looked around and gone, oh, the, the lines, is, it, is the, where's the, does there have to be a line? Can we, can we uh, you know? And to have that combination and um, be an artist and be perceived. I think many people, if you don't get Trump grump, which is what I term it, I know some people say, you know, orange man bad, Trump derangement syndrome. He's he, being able to separate the office from the person and then the combination of the two and what that becomes. And, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> I just don't want to, I don't want to, I can be critical. I can have a conversation about it. I don't know the individual, mm -hmm. right? I just don't know the individual. Um, so if you're not one, if you're not, now we're at the place where if you don't speak for the one side, you're with the other side. When did that happen? Well, it started happening gradually over time, you know, within the academy, as you and I both know. So those confluence of um, challenges, I think, um, you know, uh, I've worked with Adam Baldwin, who's a great guy, <laughs> lovely actor, smashing fellow. He's not left enough for the left, and uh, so he's extreme right. And I go, <laughs> I'm looking going, what? You know, I wouldn't think to go after or cancel James Woods. And James Woods is the lone wolf <laughs> in Hollywood, you know? And I think, again, it's, you know, to, coming back to men. Yeah. I think we have to find a way to um, what you said so beautifully about forgiveness, you know? Um, how, how, does, how does someone in the public eye get forgiven when they've been, been judged by a jury of their peers even and still are deemed to be guilty and we can't find a way to look, find, search, quest, journey to find even a morsel of good in another human being? Yeah. And it's happening uh, now, amazingly, and brazenly, it's happening to businesses, small businesses that don't align with this can be canceled now. They're, people are compiling lists and, lists. and we're, blacklists we're of, of uh, theaters. That that didn't, Is it McCarthyism? I, I don't think they read that much history. I don't know what they call it, though. Okay. <laughs> Is theaters being blacklisted now? The, well, theaters are being uh, listed. put on a, I a list. say blacklisted. I should say listed. Yeah. It is a list compiled by certain people about theaters not uh, promoting Black Lives Matter quick enough or authentically enough or promising to re uh, to reorganize uh, their structure in order to pay um, and hire black artists. Uh, they're doing it in the theater industry. They're doing it uh, with uh, restaurants. They're doing it with uh, country music singers. They're doing it across the board. And it's I don't understand how the entire culture can do this. I don't understand how the entire culture can support this. Um, I don't understand the, if you have any sort of long-term understanding of human nature that you can't just push people and shame them into doing what you want them to do. But it seems like it happened in the Academy and then it happened in, in Hollywood uh, where we, we saw that activity going on and now it's happening on all these different levels. A lot of people are yeah, exploiting it, that. And it's happening in STEM, and we knew it was happening in STEM, and, and, and it has been happening in STEM, frankly, for a good few years now. It's mm -hmm. just, it only comes to light, I think, in the media when it's actually a, attacked as something bad, like the police force. And, you know, these, these entities are mm -hmm. seen as bad, and they don't match, they don't, they can't ever win the, what's it, the oppression Olympics, I think. I don't, I don't know. But, 
Yeah, I think I think I see, you know, not meaning to be controversial and, and in no way judging the people who support the movement. I do see parallels with BLM and Me Too. You know, it just it's it's that extreme. It's that if you aren't with us, if you're not marching, um, and if you're not protesting, then you're against us. No. Maybe, maybe my friend was having her nails done and she just didn't have the time. Or maybe your friend was, you know, looking, babysitting or looking after, I mean, or maybe your friend was working or who, I mean, come on. But it has become, again, and I think it's the politics at play here. Mm-hmm. What's underlying here? You know, I try and look at both, if there has to be a side, sides. You know, I see what happened with this individual officer and whether that's more systemic. I think there are some bad policemen. And you know what? There are some bad gardeners. But my gardeners may trim my tulips too low and it takes a bit of time to grow back. Bad policemen will take lives. So that matters. And how we approach, and also on the other side, you know, raising all the millions that's been raised, there are questions being raised about where that money is going to um, and who's getting that money. Um, there's a lot of politics at play. There's a lot of history and there's a lot of power. I do get really, I do get saddened because as an artist, when I see art being stolen, looted, defaced, devalued, um, torn down, and, you know, I have to say, as a, as, a, as a proud American citizen and a very proud Englishman, the history of what England went through in World War II and, and the man who led the nation then, Winston Churchill, when I saw his, his statue being defaced and vandalized and hearing that he was the very thing that he was fighting, apparently, these days. Fascist or... I, I was, I was absolutely, I mean, I wasn't outraged. I was just, yeah, we were there. And that's, hmm. these statues are works of art, which is subjective. And you tear them, I just, you know what I thought about? I saw a statue being torn down and it just reminded me of America, you know, going in and tearing, or in the, the Iraq, was it Saddam Hussein's statue? It's like that, that resistance, that rising up and, there's got to be a better way of having a discourse mm-hmm. and not tarnishing everyone with black or white. Yeah. There is a vibrant color wheel in the, in the middle and you talk about emotions, you know, all those emotions on the, in, in the middle that we can just, you know, sit and you know, process and get groovy with. Oh, I felt a bit of shame there. <laughs> I'm a bit sad right now. I mean, even anger, you know, Benjamin, when I, when I first looked into, I studied affect theory a little and, um, uh, and uh, behavioral science and emotions, phenomenology, emotions. And I learned about anger and, and I had some transformative moments when I, cause I used to say when I was angry with someone, I'm angry at you. You're making me angry. And I realized that no one can make me angry. It's like Ricky Gervais says about offense. You know, it's not given, it's only taken. And you have a choice. And anger has clean and dirty anger. So you don't want to leave it backed up so it gets all dirty. You know, you want to find a way to express it. The day I was able to say to someone who got me angry, I said, I'm really angry with you. I was smiling. (laughs) And it wasn't, I'm really proud of myself. I was like, I'm expressing myself, like from an I place, not a you place. I'm not projecting here. And how, how we can, I hear a lot about violent communication. Hmm. Marshall, I think it was Marshall Rosen. I forget his last name. I'm terrible with names. Bless him. He wrote this amazing book called Nonviolent Communication. And it's fascinating. It's all about mediation. And he went into the two, two tribes in Africa when there was genocide going on, the Tutsis and the, um, the other tribe whose name I forget. And he mediated that, those differences. So can't we bring, couldn't, couldn't we even imagine a place eventually where someone high up in Antifa came together with someone up high up in the cake? I mean, you know, and they could say, I know I'm being ignorant about it. 
mediate <laughs> through the differences, negotiate. I mean, yeah. you have to find a way to negotiate the differences, right? Well, in, in a certain respect, there's a large portion of present politicking that's performative. That's just people expressing things for the sake of expressing them. And they don't really necessarily want uh, solution. They, they want revolution, I guess. They, they have a dream of what they want, or they have a, a cause that they want to fight, but all, they also want recognition. And that, that's, that's, I call it the recognition. You know, if we can recognize how we recognize our mm -hmm. mind to just be a little bit less reactive, but it really is. I think in future, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll get to a place where we all want our 15 minutes of anonymity. You know? <laughs> so we're not all me, 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 me. But, you know, the social media and the what it's, 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 I know with the respondent, I wouldn't be able to help if I didn't, you know, put the uniform on and get out there and talk about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. just have a, or otherwise I'd be having a conversation over, you know, tea and biscuits in my front room. Yeah. So what's going on with the respondent? What's, what's the, where are you at now? What are the next steps? You're going to have a yeah. symposium of some sort on Father's Day. Yeah. So the first, uh, the first step is the, premiere broadcast episode of the respondent. Stephen Fry is the respondent on June 3rd, uh, 21st, Father's Day at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. That will be the regular time slot for the respondent every two weeks. So after the first episode, it will be on a bi-weekly basis, new episodes. And after that um, first broadcast at 3 o'clock, uh, 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on Father's Day, it will be a symposium uh, moderated by um, someone I'm, I'm really excited to be moderate or moderated by or with or moderate with is um, the voice of reason. We need some reason. <laughs> um, so thank you. No, I, I, I'm that's, looking that's, forward that's, to that's, it. That's really the, the next step with the respondent. A concurrent podcast launch as well. The podcast will launch same day, June 21st. I have more guests that I'm interviewing so far. This first season, I think there's about 12 episodes that will be aired. Um, and then my book, The Respondent, uh, which uh, later in the year, um, I don't have a definitive date quite yet. I'm really close to it. Um, so I don't want to say because then I'll back myself into a corner. The year is half <laughs> over, though, just to, just to say. You only have six months yeah, left. It's been an interesting year, hasn't it? Yeah, it has been. No, I mean, look, I wanted to get the, I wanted to, what I wanted to do with the, the, the vlog, I guess you might call it, the video series um, and uh, the podcast was just start a conversation about some of the themes of family and uh, have a convivial conversation. Sometimes, you know, we get into it. Uh, second episode, me and the Femsplainers, there's a couple of times we get into it, always done respectfully. And um, to, to, to push forward the, the, the bigger theme of how should men respond. Um, so, you know, Sunday, this Sunday, family matters. So watch The Respondent at 1 p.m. And Stephen's such a great introduction to it because of all the people I've worked with, he's one of the loveliest, sweetest, smartest, kindest, most generous gentlemen hmm. that one would hope to come across. And, um, you know, he's living through right now, it's, you know, we know about, uh, he's been very public about his uh, personal mental health issues over the years. Um, he's had moments of deep rest or deep, pressed as i call it um and we talk about some of that we talk about uh we talk about cookery philosophy the argument from evil or the argument of evil the god question if you will uh, comedy fry and laurie um covid is very you know we have a, a very extensive chat so I'm looking forward to people tuning it'll be in. great and where, where's it going to be found it's going to be found on uh, think spot and then your okay. podcast Podcasts is on the, all the usual platforms, yeah. you know, that's, that's, that's out there. And also, you know, my website is, uh, that has a dedicated respondent page as well. Um, that's uh, realgregellis.com. So, yeah, I mean, look, I'm leaning, I'm leaning and learning my way into um, failure here. 
<laughs> and by that, I mean, f- first attempt in learning. I haven't done this before. You know, this isn't a medium I'm used to. And, um, you know, I'm just very grateful that you're uh, going to be steering me through the, the <laughs> symposium experience, yeah. my good man. And who knows what will happen? There may be moments of frivolity and silliness, because that's one of the other things as well. We, we're dealing with such an unsexy subject. Hmm. You know? I don't know, men are sexy to some people. Well, the, the, the idea of, you know, toxic masculinity mm-hmm. and men's mm-hmm. rights, mm-hmm. oh, it's another man going on about his rights. Well, my rights are your responsibility and your rights are my responsibility. So let's just keep that in mind. Mm. Every individual, you know, and how we can better the collective. Awesome. Well, this is going to be great. This is going to be a great uh, show and uh, series, and I'm looking forward to, to being a part of it. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, I will link all of the links in the description for people to find your work and both present and future. Thank you very much. And I don't know if you're aware, but there's there's a whole graphics department working on posters and whatnot for it and ThinkSpot and my team. And I'm happy to share those with you, Benjamin. I've just been so, I'm sure you are too, you know, busy and stuff. Um, but I will, I will get something to you so that you can maybe push it out as well. Yeah, yes, yeah, uh, send it, send it all over, and I'll, uh, I'll put this up. I, I have to jump on another live stream now, but I'll get this all, and I'll send you the link and uh, send it to the ThinkSpot people. This brilliant, evening. brilliant. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to uh, next Sunday. All right, Greg. Uh, thanks a lot right. for this. I'll, I'll talk to you soon. That was so much fun. Be well. Yeah. Ciao.